Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show, we welcome back the incredible Rico stories with another exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why well, it really does help build the channel and that community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. The Chimeras. Let's get straight into that. Prologue. Men continually find new ways to perpetuate evil. Part 1. A Call to Arms. Several unsold assassinations of high-ranking government officials have occurred across the EU. The world economy was suffering, and that even included the USA. Separatist groups and insurgent factions had formed, not only in the third world countries, but industrialized nations also. As usual, the elites and power brokers prospered, while those not in the loop were less fortunate. The growing anxiety and animosity towards world governments was believed to be the reason for the tensions. These assassinations were not your average hits on the privileged. They happened quickly, and there was little to no evidence left behind. But what was unusual, or even strange, was the brief descriptions people gave of the perpetrators. They were superhumanly fast, and a handful of witnesses described seeing animal-like figures. Some dismissed it as disguises or some type of high-tech suit. But some swore they saw people with the characteristics of apes, lizards, wolves, lions, or even bats. But what was sure was that the police and Interpol were facing increasing pressure to solve the murders and find ways of protecting dignitaries. The Joint Task Force Chimera budget was going through another phase of cuts due to the less friendly priorities of the current administration and due to several foreign policy debacles and unsuccessful attempts to correct domestic issues. Unrest was growing on the home front also. But, despite all of this, there had not yet been any assassination attempts on US figures. The CIA and Secretary of State were calling for a meeting with the JTC heads. Retired Navy SEAL Lieutenant Commander Jack Rogers had just assumed the director role and called on Major Trip Steele to muster the Alphas along with the ranking cadre individuals. Present in the JTC briefing room were Director Rogers, Major Still, Eric, Alex, Lars, Jamal, Tank and Abdul. Sergeant Major Goodson, Master Sergeant Jones, Master Sergeant Tame Sorensen and Sergeant Haddad and Sergeant Grant were also present. The meeting began with Secretary of State Gormless and CIA Director Lynch and an unidentified Asian American woman in the background. Lynch spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is top secret special access only. We have intel on the assassinations in the EU, and we believe we have picked up chatter indicating a possible attempt on yet to be determined official in the USA. And Jack Rogers spoke. Sir, I believe you know the type of threats we deal with here, and our budget has been cut to the bone. Why are you reading us in on such a matter? And Director Lynch turned to the woman behind him and said, Please allow me to introduce Miss Leader Chan the former genetic biologist who once worked for Gaiorgi Sovros. And you could hear a pin drop in the room as Eric and Tammy tensed up. She spoke saying, I once worked for Sovros Group International, when I was hired under the guise of doing genetic experiments to cure cancer and other diseases. I was young, ambitious and naive. But about a year into my work, I began to question what we were injecting people with. There were all kinds of deformities with people taking on the characteristics of animals, I protested and wanted to quit, but they promised me things would get better. Well, things got worse, and one day I saw a dead specimen of a child who had the appearance of a rodent and a bat combined. Well, it was heartbreaking, and I lost it. I pretended that I was having a nervous breakdown, hoping they would let me leave. Instead, they put me under guard until I faked a seizure, causing them to take me to the hospital emergency room, where I escaped, and here I am. Part 2. A New Challenge Major Steele spoke. Sir, you know there is no love lost for Saras here, but it is your expectations to have my people become glorified bodyguards? Director Lynch responded. 
Not exactly, but we don't want to send elements to JTC abroad and to DC in an attempt to stop these assassinations and apprehend the culprits. And Jack Rogers asked, Just exactly what and how many of these Chimera assassins are we dealing with? And Miss Chan responded, About 15, I think, Director Lynch said. We believe they are working in groups of five, and intel suggests there will be attempts made soon in Belgium or the UK. We also have credible intel on targets here in the US, possibly even Secretary Gormas and others yet determined. Eric whispered to Jamal. You know, in the UK, Gormas is the old English slang word, meaning stupid, dull or clumsy. Jamal responded with a stern face. <laughs> How fitting, given our current state of affairs. And Tripp held his head down and bit his lips so as not to laugh. And CIA Director Lynch announced, Ladies and gentlemen, listen up. You are to formulate a plan and divide your team among the aforementioned locations. Miss Chan will accompany the group going to Europe. He will be in plain clothes and you cannot take the dogs with you. And he will only be allowed to carry sidearms concealed. He will be moving out at 0600 tomorrow. As several groans and grounds erupted from the group as even the usually stoic Jamal seemed angered. Then Jack Rogers spoke up. First, there is a matter of great concern here. And Director Lynch leaned forward and said, Yes. And Jack continued, Most of our funding was pulled and we still have two young alphas in the program at the almost deserted Langley training facility. Eric and Jamal stood up and protested. How can you allow these young men to languish there? Lynch looked over at Secretary Gormless and then looked back at Jack and said, Continue. Jack, Eric and Jamal were now on their feet at the front of the room, joined by the other alphas. And Jack continued, Sir, we want you to bring them, the ducks and the handlers here, and provide enough funding to at least complete the training. And I want to make this crystal clear right here, right now. This government will one day regret killing this program. Lynch stared at Gormless for a few moments, and then the secretary said, Deal, I'll make it happen. You can expect Miss Chan there this afternoon. The JTC went to work on a plan with Jack assigning Trip to be with Leader Chan to head up the European team. Jack, Jamal and Tank will remain stateside. Jack will call Hawk and Chuck to coax them out of retirement to participate with a domestic protection detail. They decided to have the young Alphas brought there by morning for some of the job training. The worldwide simulcasted teleconference was coming up at the EU HQ in Belgium. That would include the UK and the USA. Intel suggested that there might be simultaneous hits there, or it might be a distraction from the one in London, or vice versa. The trip met leader at the airfield and introduced himself. On the way back to JTC HQ, they chatted. So, said Trip, you don't look or sound like you're all Chinese. And she smiled. Well, my father was Dr. Tom Chandler, and my mom was a registered nurse, and they had medical practice in Chinatown. Dad died after a two-year struggle with cancer. And I was determined to find a cure. While I was a grad student at Caltech, mom met a Chinese biochemist. He seemed like a very nice man, and they got married about a year and a half later. China wanted him to return to work at a special laboratory to study cures for diseases. He explained how I could work on a cancer cure there without the restrictions that we have here. Still, being very emotional after Dad's death, I agreed. He suggested I use the last name Chan so as not to arouse any unnecessary suspicion. At first, things were okay, but I slowly started to hate it. Then Mom and I gradually became prisoners. The Chinese were constantly pressuring me to marry some influential government or businessman. But when I saw the specimen, that was it for me. I sent encrypted messages to a friend in South Korea who helped smuggle Mom and I out of the country to the American embassy there. We spent three days in the bottom of a stinky rat-infested fishing ship to conceal us from the Chinese Navy. That trip was very taken by Lida. She was an attractive, athletic woman. You might not think she was a brilliant biochemist. So, tell me about you, said Lida. Well, West Point graduate in mechanical engineering, played linebacker for the army, went to ranger school, made Green Beret. I speak Arabic some Farsi, Russian, and a little Chinese. General take to me under his wing about two years ago, and here I am. 
and her face slowly revealed a warm smile, and she said, For the first time in a long time, I feel at ease, and she and Trip seemed very drawn to each other. Part 3. Unfinished Business The teams met at the airfield to board the C-17s for Europe. Tammy, Anders and Abasha came to the airfield to see Eric off. The dog had survived his Thunderbird injuries but now had to use a prosthetic leg. He would live his days happily as a guard dog for the young prodigy Anders, who was almost four and reading books at third and fourth grade level and developing a real knack for math. He was also the size of a first grader never seemed to run out of energy. Also, arriving for the trip was the young Alphys, Bartholomew, McGregor, aka Bart, and Marco Penzoni. They were almost 17 years old and both at 6 foot 5 and around 275 or 280 pounds, and with a lot of growing yet to come. Bart would accompany Team Britain, and Marco would be part of Team Belgium. Chuck, Harry, and Akimi arrived to wish the teams good luck and proceeded to the JTC HQ for a briefing with Jack Rogers. The domestic mission would be to supplant the federal agents assigned to the Secretary of State's event at the International Hotel Convention Center in DC. They got busy pulling up intel on all dignitaries, guests and vendors. Stopping or preventing a terrorist attack or assassination on the US soil was priority one, but for Harry it was bagging one of Sovros's assassins to get valuable intel on his nefarious organization. On the plane ride to Europe, they decided to get acquainted with Marco. Uh, what are your interests? said Tripp. Well, I have a passion for chemistry, specifically mixing up everyday ingredients into special concoctions. The leader responded. Great, we have something in common. Are you interested in biochemistry? Marco responded. Uh, actually, I enjoy mixing things that react, especially the breaking or making of interatomic bonds. With a puzzled look, leader responded. You mean explosions? Most definitely, Marco responded. She gave a sheepish grin as Tripp tried not to laugh. The leader went on to brief Tripp and Alex about how people were injected with DNA from Sasquatch, dogmen, tigers, lions, reptilians, and even bad human creatures. The unfortunate guinea pigs took on their characteristics and mannerisms. Some were strong and fast, able to jump and climb and even fly for some distances. But all shared one trait. They were angry and full of despair at what had happened to them. These poor souls volunteered for experimental treatments, thinking that they might be cured of cancer or other diseases. All they found was a misery much worse than death. And I cried bitterly over the part I played during those two years of torture. And Tripp responded, Maybe if Savros were injected with all that shit, his organisation might crumble. Alex suggested that although personal vengeance might feel good, capturing one of the tortured experiments might glean useful information to undermine his empire. On the plane, Eric sat in a dark, brooding mood. Revenge for the kidnapper of Anders was on his mind. And Abdul whispered to him, Brother, I sense your animus and beseech you to be reasoned and of clear mind. And Eric responded, Yes, retribution is at the forefront of my thinking. This evil cycle fan thinks himself about morale and strength. Someone must relegate him to history. Do not compromise safety for satisfaction. Your family is one of greater value, said Abdul. Eric nodded and placed his hand upon Abdul's shoulder with a smile. Sergeant Goodson quietly listened and offered a suggestion. As much as we would love to throttle old Goyorgi's neck, Maybe that's the wrong approach. The Alphas listened intently as Goodson continued. You see, he said, that old summer bitch is about 90. And killing him won't hurt him the way ending his empire would. We need to expose him for the whole world to see. Instead of killing his pets, maybe we need to capture one or two who might be in the mood for revenge. And Bart spoke up with wisdom beyond his years, saying yes, we should persuade them that they have more in common with us than with their evil masters, so that they will reveal needed secrets. Abdul suggested they change the subject and get acquainted with young Bart. And Eric asked, So, tell me, lad, what are your interests? I am an inventor. I like to improve upon mechanical things or create new mechanical gadgets. 
I have you invented many things, said Eric. Bart responded, Well, not so much since combining a leaf blower with a propane heater. The mentors found it ingenious until the starch building combusted. Sergeant Goodson put his face in his hands to hide the laugh as Eric remarked, Ha, huh, the folly of youth. Part 4. The Home Front Let's get straight into that. As Team DC mingled among the dignitaries, more VIPs and government officials began to arrive. Boosting the economy and decreasing the growing unemployment was on everybody's mind. A terrorist attack against these key figures on US soil could impact not just the country, but the entire world. Preventing any coordinated international attacks was the imperative for the JTC. Although the Feds already had people at entrances and on rooftops, they weren't necessarily equipped or prepared for what was coming. Nor did they know what to look for. Hawk, Chuck, Jamal, Tank, and Sergeant Grant split up with other team members and got their heads on swivels to watch for any sign of an attack. It was half of two men as large as Jamal and Tank to look inconspicuous, even though they were dressed in suits. Sergeant Jones operated a drone from a control room and had access to all the video feeds. The usual federal agents were puzzled about these new no-name security specialists and what exactly they were looking for. But JTC was looking for things not previously seen or even recognisable to the average Fed. In the ballroom, the gala and dining commenced with security three deep everywhere. But while the usual security experts focused mostly on things occurring inside, JTC's attention was focused more on the outside. And as nightfall sat in, Drone footage caught two large men jogging through a nearby park. A seemingly homeless man walked oddly with what appeared to be a deformity or a hump on his back before he settled onto a park bench about a hundred metres across the street. There were so many homeless that this wouldn't usually glean attention, but given the circumstances, everybody was a suspect. Suddenly, an overnight delivery van from a well-known company sped down the street from the other side of the park towards the barricades. Horns blared and brakes squealed as the van swerved in and out of traffic before slamming into a concrete barrier. Security had no time to open fire before the vehicle erupted into a huge explosion, knocking people off of their feet for a block in every direction. Windows were shattered in the conference center as the wall shook and plaster fell from the ceiling. The regular security detail began reacting to the panic and trying to move the dignitaries to predetermined safe locations within the building. But JTC turned their focus to the outside and towards the sky. External security cameras were knocked offline. The Sergeant Jones's drone was momentarily blinded by the explosion, but came back into focus long enough to catch a glimpse of a small humanoid winged creature flying from a high rise across the street and land on top of the convention center. Hawk, Chuck, and Jamal covered the main entrance to the ballroom as Tank and Sergeant Grant went to the side entrance near the kitchen. Sergeant Jones called over comms. Wing figure just landed on the roof, and I see two hooded tangles rushing the front entrance. Hawk called out. We got the front. Tank and Grant get the service elevators. Suddenly gunfire rang out as bodies of security agents were flung through the air, and a commotion approached Hawk and company. Two huge men in hoodies approached rapidly. Their faces were like hairy Neanderthals, and they wore heavy body armor. Chuck and Hall began firing at 45s, but the men charged onwards. Tank and Sergeant Grant heard screams followed by what could be described as a howl when service employees ran or were knocked down. A man on all fours ran at a corner and slashed the throats of two security guards before they could react. But it wasn't really a man. It looked like the werewolf from the old black and white wolfman movies. Tank and Grant drew their weapons and the creature veered so fast they couldn't take a shot the warrior striking innocence. The creature was by them in an instant, and Tank gave chase, followed by Grant. There were too many people in the close proximity for Hawk and company to continue firing. Jamal tackled one of the Neanderthals, and they rolled across the floor. Chuck and Hawk chased the other one. Hawk screamed over comms. This is a diversion. Get a team on the roof. And Sergeant Jones responded. Shit, now they're reporting some kind of lizard creature coming up from the basement sewer. Part 5. 
Part 5. The EU Dilemma. As Team Brussels surveyed the area around EU HQ, vehicles containing military heads from around the EU began arriving. A successful hit on any member could further increase internal tensions and invite aggressive actions in an already volatile Eastern Europe. The NATO Security General was scheduled to speak at this regional event for member nations. The assassinations of Secretary or other key officials would further destabilize regional and world conditions. Trip and Lars covered the main entrance while Alex and young Marco took a position near the side service doors. Lida would remain in the surveillance room, looking for anything unusual. Other JTC members were in plain clothes throughout the venue. A night surveillance camera spotted two hooded figures ambling down an alleyway one block over. One was large and muscular, the other smaller, and walking with a strange gait. Suddenly, another camera pointed at a tall building across the way, and it caught a momentary glimpse of a figure gliding horizontally while clinging to vertical surfaces. The leader called out over comms. I think a reptilian is scaling the building across the plaza. And Corporal Crane called out. Drone just caught a winged creature land on the top of the elevator shaft. A second later, a figure ran effortlessly about on all fours in front of the convention center, causing confusion and shrieking like a large cat. Security and bystanders were knocked down while nobody could get a clear shot in the confusion. The leader screamed, Oh my God, it must be Alexa, the Tigress. And Tripp called out, Get people on that elevator shaft. When a rumble was heard from above the elevated cars began to plummet. Another explosion went off as two drones came flying out of alleys across the plaza and detonated in front of the building, shattering glass and setting off vehicle alarms. Two large, hooded figures charged the front doors, scattering people, and security tried in vain to get a clear shot. The two figures rushed the main ballroom entrance and were met by Tripp and Alex, while Lars and Marco covered the service entrance. Tripp fired four rounds into what appeared to be a man with ape-like features and wearing body armor before the man ran over him, knocking him flat. Alex fired two rounds from his Desert Eagle 50 cal, knocking his target down for a split second. This lizard-like creature agilely went onto all fours and sped down the hall in the midst of the chaos. Lars and Marco reacted to the commotion from the service elevators as two figures erupted from the doors. A cat-like figure sprinted on all fours knocking people and equipment everywhere. A man lizard raced up the walls and ceilings as Marco fired his 50 cal round, narrowly missing it. A woman with bat-like features flew through the dining hall, trying to get to the podium as security fired shots, missing the agile creature. Now this protection detail grabbed the Secretary General and tried to usher him quickly out when somebody screamed, It's got a bomb! Alex pulled Tripp to his feet as screams got louder from within the ballroom. The ape and lizard man were now in the ballroom attacking people and working their way towards the front where the logjam of VIPs was. Plain clothes JTC members were now converging on the ballroom as a pandemonium unfolded. The bat creature darted about as if looking for a proper place to toss the small backpack she held in her hands. Lars picked up a round table and broke off the legs, and then held it like a frisbee at this bat lady, knocking her to the ground. He and Marco held her under the table until the EOD team could arrive and cover her with thick ballistic blankets. A JTC member reached under the table while she shrieked and shot her before she could press the plunger on the explosive charge. But the danger wasn't over, as the ape man with the help of the reptile had managed to grab the secretary general and run down the hall with him over his shoulder, like a tow sack. Two security personnel confronted a man with weapons drawn, and before they could react, Tigress charged from behind and sliced their throats. The JTC team had shot and killed the reptile man, but now had to figure out how to save the Secretary General when the comms crackled with. Another reptile creature just burst out of the elevator shaft. Part 6 The Tempest on Downing As Team Britain staked out the convention centre near Downing Street, Dignitaries from around Europe began arriving for the economic summit. A disruption in proposed economic policies could affect a struggling economy and further disrupt recovery efforts with an unhappy populace. Destabilizing a currency could lead to a devaluation and hostile takeovers of key sectors from aggressive entities. 
Eric and Young Bark staked out the main meeting entrance, while Abdul and Sergeant Goodson set up at the service entrance. Spec Dobson remained in the surveillance room, getting ready to launch a drone. It was now nightfall as the festivities got underway. An IR camera caught a fleeting image of what appeared to be a winged figure glide through the air from a high rise to high rise. For just a split second, the image of the figure moving cat like on all fours was caught by the drone as it flew over a neighboring alley. Two JTC members hurried to the main elevator shafts, accompanied by two British MI6 agents. They called out, Get eyes on the roof! when a security detail below the penthouse reported hearing noise in the ductwork. The comms crackled with, There's some bloke running about on all fours clinging to the ceiling of the basement parking garage. And at that instant, simultaneous explosions were heard from both above and below shaking the building. All hell erupted as two hooded figures ran at superhuman speeds, crashing through guards and jumping the barricades out front. A voice called out, we got a bloody werewolf and an ape man. The shots rang out. Eric and Bart ran towards the main ballroom entrance as Abdul and Sergeant Goodson drew their weapons and peered down the hallway towards the kitchen and service elevators. A woman screamed as one man flew through the air, followed by a rush of people. No more than two steps behind the crowd was a man running on all fours with the features of a lion and the mane to go with it. Suddenly, another figure appeared and ran up the walls and hugged the ceiling. Sergeant Goodson fired around, grazing the creature's arm as it shrieked and took a swipe at Goodson, slicing his arm when it ran by. Abdul and the lion man collided and rolled into the main entrance area, overturning tables and chairs. Eric tackled the Neanderthal and was in the process of beating him down when out of the corner of his eye, young Bart and the wolfman were rolling towards him in a pitched struggle. He slammed the ape man in the face with a strong forearm and released just long enough to grab the dogman. When he did, the Neanderthal squirted under him and into the meeting area as he and Bart had to guard against a barrage of claws and teeth. Goodson was now chasing the lizard into the ballroom as Abdul fended off slicing attempts from the lion man as it tried to sink its teeth into his neck. At that instant, the back creature flew into the room and threw two large gas canisters as a JTC member shot her, but it was too late because a loud boom and a flash blinded attendees, causing them to choke and cough from the smoke. Then a woman screamed out, It's got the Prime Minister! And hysteria ensued. The large lizard man had the PM over his shoulder, running out of the main room. Sergeant Goodson screamed over comms for the team members to block the exit and the elevator shaft, but it was too late. The lizard scurried up the elevator shaft with the PM, holding on for dear life. Bart being the smallest and most agile of the Alphas, ran into the shaft and started climbing up after them. Surveillance cameras spotted the lion man running up the stairwells in an effort to no doubt meet the reptile at top of the elevator shaft. It seemed now that the idea wasn't to kill, but to kidnap the PM. The dog man and the bat woman now lay dead from 50 cow rams, and the ape man was tranquilized, but the danger was far from over as teams desperately sprinted up the stairwells and blocked elevator shafts. A helicopter circled above, ready to fast rope four men onto the roof, but nobody was sure that the PM would survive being dragged up the elevator shaft. Part 7 The battle raged on. Let's get straight into that. As the security team surrounded Secretary Gormless in an attempt to usher him out, an explosion erupted in the elevator shaft, startling the crowd. Bodies flew about as one of the Neanderthals and a wolfman charged towards security team. Tank overtook and tackled the wolfman, and as they rolled across the floor, a team member with a trank gun tried to get a shot. Hawk and Chuck jumped onto the ape man and rolled across the floor with it, and just as it looked like the situation might be de-escalated a bit, the reptile ran across the ceiling drawing fire. Screeches came from down the hall as the back creature flew flashbangs and gas canisters. The lizard creature quickly descended upon the secretary's security detail, taking two of them out before anybody could react. Tank had successfully subdued the wolfman, and Jamal had beat one of the ape men into submission long enough to be tranquilized. 
Sergeant Goodson launched his six foot four, two hundred and fifty pound frame onto the back of the reptile, and they rolled across the floor as the remainder of the Gormer security detail huddled around him with weapons drawn. Chuck and Hawk were engaged in hand to hand combat with the other ape man. Hawk had him in the submission hold around his thick neck, but he was able to shake him off. It turned his rage on Chuck, and he drew his forty five and commanded him to freeze. He ignored him, but charged, causing Chuck to fire two deadly headshots. The bad woman settled near Hawk and cried out, saying, I surrender! Please don't kill me! Another shot rang out as the reptile had Grant pinned against the wall, attempted to plunge its claws into his throat. A team member put a round into the side of his head, and the remaining Neanderthal, and the remaining Neanderthal was now hogtied. The bad woman was in restraints, and the wolfman was sound asleep. The tigress was backed into a corner and about to pounce when two tranquilizer rounds struck her. Alex tackled the reptile and held him long enough for a team member to fire a tranquilizer round into its neck from point blank range. The ape man raced around the corner, heading for the back exit with young Marco hot on his heels as two JTC members tried to follow. The other reptile was waiting by a large window. It had shattered. As Marco tackled the ape, a JTC member tranquilized it. The secretary had toppled onto the ground and was grabbed by the reptile who dove out the window and began a vertical ascent up the building. Marco hit the stairwell bounding upwards at a staggering pace. The Neanderthal in the hallway charged the two JTC members, another security resulting in several shots killing it. As the Batman tried to escape the ballroom, it pulled two grenades from the vest and was immediately met with a hail of bullets as it fell to the floor, dead. The drone fed real-time footage of the reptile scaling the high-rise wall with the secretary. It started to end its trek on the roof, but was met by security forces. It turned downwards and burst through a large window. The drone pilot called out on the location, and Marco burst out the stairwell on the 15th floor and met the lizard man before it could reach the elevators. A few seconds later, Alex bounded out of the other stairwell, and the lizard man was boxed in. Alex drew his desert eagle as Marco inched forward, and Alex said, Whatever evil has befallen you, allow us to help. Your life isn't worth it. And the reptile hissed a reply, saying, I have no life. Then dropped the secretary to the floor and crashed through the window, falling to its death. The two JTC members and two MI6 agents burst into the penthouse hallway from the roof as the lion man emerged from the stairwell. They drew their weapons and ordered it down onto the floor to be restrained. An MI6 agent said, Come on, mate, give it up and let us get you some help. It stood motionless for about three seconds and replied in a raspy voice, There is no help for me, and charged them. Multiple shots rang out as they put it down. It was then that a reptile burst out of the elevator shaft with the PM still over his shoulder. A stare down began as the agent said, Easy now, mate. Nobody needs to get hurt. Think about it. The creature slowly backed up when Bart burst out of the shaft and tackled the lizard, causing it to drop the PM. The MI6 agent grabbed the PM and carried him away as Bart and the JTC members tried to subdue the reptile. Neither of the JTC members had tranquilizers, and Bart tried to knock the lizard unconscious with several forearms to the head. It scratched Bart across the face, causing him to loosen his grip. It made a beeline towards the stairs and to the roof. But Corporal Sander stood there, with his weapon drawn, and pointed at the reptile's head. Don't do it, he said. And the creature abruptly lunged at him, resulting in a double tap of two rounds to the tortured soul's face. The storm on Downing had ended, with the PM safe and all of the Chimeras either dead or subdued. Part 8. A never-ending story. Let's get straight into that. Stateside, Hawk and the team readied video equipment to record statements from the surviving Chimeras who wanted revenge on Cerberus for these cruel genetic experiments. Jerome the Wolfman and bad-like creature named Susie were ready to talk. 
But before they could begin, the Secret Service rushed in and broke up the party. And Agent Bush said, We cannot allow you to record this. Hawk was furious as Jamal and Tank protested. Little did they know that their counterparts in Belgium and the UK were being denied the same opportunity to obtain video evidence about Soros and his evil actions. In Belgium, Lida was trying to console Lexa, the tigress whom she remembered from the laboratory. Lida was in the process of recording her statements with her phone when NATO security agents burst in and snatched the device. Trip bristled and confronted him as his six foot one, 225 pound frame tensed up for a fight. Other JTC members stood ready behind him. His phone rang with a call from Director Rogers, who asked him to put the call on speaker. Stand down, troops. That's an order from way above our heads. Rogers went on to tell them that they had done an outstanding job and to allow the feds to take it from here. The scenario was repeating itself in London as Raoul, the Neanderthal, prepared to tell all about the Soros genetic experiments. Several MI6 agents burst in, saying no recording will be allowed. Eric was furious and had to be restrained by Abdul and Bart. And Hawk and Chuck now shook their heads in disgust at the Secret Service took custody of the Chimeras. Chuck proclaimed, When are we going to fucking learn to stay retired? And Hawk looked at Chuck with a stark face and responded, Should we stay retired or should we use what we know? The tank responded, Maybe it's time for a well-deserved European vacation. Jamal pondered and replied, ah, The right information at the right time is deadlier than a weapon. Now in Brussels, Lida cried as Trip put his arms around her, and she said, Please, don't let go of me. Ah, sure thing, he responded as he smiled and held her close. She looked up at him and said, You know, this is far from over. But in London the mood was much different as Eric displayed his indignance over the events. He looked at Abdul and Bart saying, Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. The young alphas nodded in unison and said, Sun Tzu, the art of war. Epilogue Those who seek to control others should first control themselves. Miyamoto Musashi Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an action-packed, hard-racing story there. From the incredible mind of our brother, from another mother, Mr. Rico Stories. Once again, Rico, absolutely knocking it out of the ballpark with such intense action and carefully crafted work. As ever, I hope you enjoyed this rendition. I really can't wait to dive into your next one. And of course, the sci-fi that I know you've been working on in the background. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you think you got the minerals to pen the next big hit, then why not get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're having a fantastic week at work or school or perhaps you're a long distance driver. Whatever it is that you do, I hope you're giving it to you all and are seizing every moment and challenging every day. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.